Thank you for listening to Comics for Fun and Profit. This is Drew with a special episode of my other podcast that I co-host regularly. And uh, it's Weekly Comic Spotlight over at John Mayo's comic book page. And uh, for those of you who haven't heard it, I wanted to give you a chance to listen to it. It's a standard review show of uh, a Marvel, a DC, and an independent comic. Uh, each week. So uh, check this out. And if you like it, go over there and subscribe or check out uh, those those episodes. They're a lot of fun. So thanks again for listening. Um, here you go. This is Weekly Comics Spotlight 528 for comics originally released on September 20th, 2017. Now starting us off in DC is Wonder Woman Conan number one. This is a co-published book with uh, Dark Horse, because of course they've got Conan these days, and six-issue miniseries. Obviously, we're both familiar with Wonder Woman. I am passingly familiar with Conan, but not particularly well-read. Uh, I'm sure I've asked you this question before, like one of the last times, probably when we did uh, Conan Red Sonia. How familiar are you with the Conan stuff? You just, yeah, I've read a few, um, enjoy, enjoyed the stuff I read, but I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on Conan, and and don't go back uh, to the beginning. Um, just uh, sampled over the years and enjoyed some of the things I've read and, and like the character. All right. So you're not going to be able to ask uh, answer my first question that I'm going to ask, which is, um, again, passingly familiar with this. I'm familiar with Conan the Barbarian, the King, the Conqueror. I forget what else. I don't recall ever having read a story of Conan the Eight-Year-Old. Now, granted, we only get a page of it here, but I thought that was an interesting way to start the story. Um, I was a little surprised, flip the page, and boom, it's sometime later. But I think there's plenty of story material to be had for a young Conan. Yeah. While this is a crossover and Wonder Woman gets top billing, it is very much a Conan story with Wonder Woman or, uh, you know, Diana, uh, or Yana as she's called here. She's in it, but kind of as a guest star at best. Um, I mean, she's got a decent showing, but it's it's not her story. This is written by Gail Simone and penciled by Aaron Lepresti, and I thought both did a really good job. Um, I thought Aaron Lepresti in particular, when we finally get to, to see Wonder Woman, did a fantastic job of giving her period-appropriate attire that was evocative of her costume, so you can tell kind of who she is, even though she's not in her full regalia or whatever. And clearly something's up, and somebody or something has clouded Wonder Woman's mind and kind of left her here barely aware of, of who she is. But there's still that, that aspect of her coming through, uh, which I thought was cool. And while I'm more on the Wonder Woman, you know, fan base than the, the, the Conan fan base, just from my background and such, this set up the story well. I'm looking forward to seeing where it's going, but I am hoping for a bit more Wonder Woman per se. Uh, than we got so far, and I'm expecting from where they went here that there's going to be some mystery of how did she get where she is, not know who she is, and Conan's going to help, you know, kind of, I don't say rescue her, but help her, you know, get out of this, uh, and they'll, they'll part ways. Now, whether it's a parting of ways where it's a one mini series and done, or something where there is more to come, like there has been with the Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or certainly the Green Lantern Star Trek stuff. Don't know. Yeah, I, th I thought she was well represented in this first issue. Um, uh, I think a little more than than you. I really liked the arena stuff. I thought was great. A little bit of her flashback. Um, you know, I'm curious about this Yana who uh, Conan thinks she is because you know that would be news to anybody who's read Wonder Woman that she was ever that character so that that would be hard that would be hard to kind of shoehorn into continuity on the dc side but that would be that would be a fun direction to go um i i kind of knew you know as we were reading this and uh, and you could kind of see the handwriting on the wall that i bet you they're going to get forced to fight each other in this pit at some oh, point Oh come on of course and, and they kind of went that way and i was like oh then yeah that's i guess you had to go that way that's fine um the two, the two ravens, crows. Uh, I don't know those characters, and I don't know if they're 
new to the myth mythology or they're a part of Conan's world that I've missed out on or a part of Wonder Woman's world that I've missed out on, but I don't know who they are. Um, that was, that was kind of an interesting sidebar and I'm sure we'll see a little more of those two in the future. Um, I don't know how big of a deal it was kind of gross there. Yes. The, yes. I, was, I thought of you when I saw the, the, them, uh, having making a meal, uh, there of the, yeah. the fallen guy. And I thought, Oh, I bet you John loves this part. And, um, but you know, I thought, I thought the Lepresti art was great. It was terrific. And, other than that one part with the crows. Absolutely. <laughs> and that was also well done, but maybe too well done. Um, and I really, yeah, I really liked her character as, you know, just being overcome by this large group of, uh, of soldiers, that maybe if she was of full faculty and had all her uh, wits about her, they wouldn't have even have been able to take her on. And, you know, she, she obviously took care of the three attackers in the, in the arena pretty handily. And, you know, you could just see that, yeah, she's, she's going to be uh, w- represented well in this. And, and it, it, I thought, I thought she was great. I thought Conan was great. And, and, you know, he had a kind of a, a sensitive side that I don't remember coming out a lot. And, you know, he he really has a fondness for who th- he thinks she is. And that could play out in a fun way over the next six issues or next five issues. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff here that was laid in this first issue. And um, I really it really worked well for me. And uh, I, I love I love these crossovers that DC does. Uh, you know, some work better than others, but I really like the I really like the attempts at crossing these properties and seeing how they work well together. And um, this one was fun. Absolutely. It is. And she was a, a good fit in this story. I mean, she fits in Conan's world, uh, the way they, they portrayed her and stuff. And my point wasn't that she, we didn't get much of her. It's not like one of those, I think it was, um, <laughs> yeah, it was one of the Star Trek ones, Star Trek and Black Planet of the Apes. Yeah. Yeah. Where at the end we get a gorilla or two and that's it. It wasn't that way. We get plenty of Wonder Woman here, but the story was told from Conan's perspective. He was the, the, the character we're following, and he interacts with her. So she is entering his story. It's not him entering her story. And it's not a big deal either way. Uh, to your point, she is well used and well represented here. We get plenty of her and stuff. It just feels to me that when the story ends, she will go off uh, to wherever, you know, either back to, to being Wonder Woman in the present day or wherever she is in this continuity kind of a thing. Because I don't think they're trying to fit this into the DC continuity. Right. Um, but then we'll end on, you know, Conan being Conan, continuing to wander or whatever. You know, the, the final note feels like it should be on him because it feels like it's his story. And I'll be curious if it's if we definitively find out if she is Yana or not. It could become that we never really know. Yeah, I, I read the story where I interpreted it as she was, but it could easily go either way. And, and to your point, uh, well, I'm I'm hoping that's the case. I'm rooting for that. Yeah, but I, I, I was just trying to wrap my mind. She has those other origins that are in my head and that those pesky that pesky continuity, which sometimes gets in the way. And I'm like, well, I don't know how she could be really. Well, I. To my mind, one, you've got to throw continuity out the window when you do a crossover like this. These are the characters as they exist in in a world as if they had always been in one world, potentially, unless they blatantly cross over like they did with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Batman. So I don't feel they're beholden to the whole Themyscira origin and all of that sort of a thing. Well, we have swapped roles. <laughs> I'm usually the guy that doesn't care that much about continuity, and you're usually be- pounding the, the the fist on the table about I don't the, the history is, of the character. I don't see this as part of the shared universe of DC. Okay, okay. This is a co-published thing. They're going to do concessions to because this is not something that either company can really reference in the ongoing stories of these characters afterwards. It's just they have the rights to to use Conan now, but we're not going to see in. Wonder Woman, whatever, you know, oh, yeah, well, when I was hanging around with Conan back there, this happened. So we're never going to see a Batman story with an asterisk, see Batman TMNT Volume 1. One, we don't see footnotes. (laughs) Two, it's highly unlikely. They may have done that once or twice referencing, like, JLA Avengers or something like that, but that's really rare. Um, 
So in my mind, these sorts of crossovers have always played by different rules than the ongoing adventures in the monthly books. And this goes as far back as, you know, the Spider-Man, Superman stuff, or the uh, the New Teen Titans, X-Men stuff of the 80s, etc. And I don't expect this to be the Wonder Woman that'll go pop back into her regular monthly book. And I kind of don't want it to be, because that feels a little forced or odd, but it's entirely possible and could be sold acceptably that this is that Wonder Woman and through some kind of arcane magic of Cersei or somebody else or one of the other gods or whatever, she's, you know, been been cast back in time, given a, a magical new origin or whatever, uh, to hide her identity, either to keep her safe or to just get her out of the way, depending which god did it. Um maybe Yeah, well with, with that with that being said then, you know, I'm I'm really rooting for it, the Yana thing to play out because I, I love the little glimpse of them young and mm-hmm. together and friends and uh, I mean that sounds like a fun series in itself right there um, and so yeah I, I want a little more of that and and I yeah I hope that I hope that plays plays out then I'm, I'm curious how they're going to develop the relationship between Wonder Woman and Conan uh, throughout this and I'm really wondering depending how this does or whatnot. Is this something that will have a uh, suitable springboard into further crossovers if they want to do them? Or is it something where it's written to where it's like, hey, at the end of this, we're done, and and that's about it. It'd be hard to kind of fit them back together. That's one of the challenges with these sorts of of cross-company crossovers, um, particularly when one of the characters is also a licensed property, uh, because you kind of want to, I think, get in, do the story, and get out, and you're not really necessarily expecting to, to do that sequel or whatever. I thought this was fun. I thought it was good. It set the story up and had enough payoff that it wasn't, like, all set up. It's like, oh, well, next time we'll actually get the story of Wonder Woman and Conan. We got some of that here. I was happy with this. Uh, of course, Aaron Lepresti art, hard to go wrong with that. The guy's terrific. Um, for me, this is a B plus. I recommend it, even if you're not uh, particularly well-steeped in the Conan mythos, because I certainly am not. I was I'm right on that that line between a B plus and an A minus, and I'm gonna give it the A minus. I've just you know just reliving it here. Um, there's there's so much more to like than you know the 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 couple of little quibbles that I had, um, and so I'm gonna give it the A minus. And and yeah, I, I recommend people check this out. It's it's a lot of fun and a, a really good uh, story with with both of those characters and really good setup for what's to come. Uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Cool. Shall we move on to our Marvel book? Yes. This is Luke Cage number five. Uh, have you been reading this title? Yes. Have you watched the Netflix show? No. Okay. I think they're doing a pretty good job here of sort of walking the line of this being firmly within the Marvel Comics continuity, but also reasonably accessible to those unfamiliar with that coming in through the Netflix route. This story focuses on the scientist that gave Luke Cage his powers, who happens to now be giving other people similar such powers. Um, and, of course, that was an aspect of the Netflix show. So, okay, you got to cover the origin there. That's fine. So people would be familiar with that. Again, gives them a, an on-ramp. I thought this was a good story. I'm not going to say it was a brilliant story or a pivotal story. that One of the must-reads of the, the life and times of Luke Cage, uh, you know, looking at his full history. It's, it's fine. It's good. I do think one or two of these characters is likely to come back, uh, specifically this Kevin Larson character. Kevlar is a great name for him with being Kevin Larson. I think that I really enjoy that. Nick thought, thought that character name was pretty cool and and well designed. And I can't can't believe it hasn't been used before. Well, and it's also almost I don't say stereotypically Marvel. But you look at a lot of the older characters and their code name and their real name. It's like, well, I see how they got to it. Yeah. You know, it, it would be like if, if uh, Tom DeFalco uh, was in the Marvel Universe, Sam Wilson would have been out of a job because Tom would have been the Falcon. <laughs> just, just the way it would have been. Um, art here was good. It was solid. It was not, oh, my God, amazing. But it told the story really well. It was a nice, clean art style. Um by and large, I liked what they did here. This whole story is set in New Orleans, which effectively kind of sets it aside from Luke's entanglements in New York. You know, the wife, the kids, the 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 Iron Fist, the Avengers, you know, and everybody else and stuff. So it, it gives him kind of 
a little bit more narrative freedom to do what he needs to do here or whatever. I have no idea if the next issue is going to continue in New Orleans or if they're going to go back to New York or what's going on. Uh, I, I mean, at some point he needs to go back to, to Jessica Jones and their kid and stuff um, or continue to go hang out with uh, Iron Fist or, you know, the Defenders series or the whatever team of Avengers he may or may not be on today. But I think giving it a little breathing room uh, from all of those characters benefited the story. Um, and I liked how this clearly fit in with the continuity, the reference to the super soldier serum and some of the characters that had been augmented by it, including one or two that I hadn't totally realized had been augmented by a super soldier serum or derivative thereof. But this seems like the sort of thing that could act as an on-ramp into the, the Marvel Universe of comics from the Netflix stuff if people really like the, uh, the Luke Cage show. Yeah, I mean, I really like Luke Cage in The Defenders. I really like him when he's in Jessica Jones. I enjoyed uh, the Power Man and Iron Fist volume previous to this. Um, but, but but this hasn't really done much for me up to this point. I, I've decided to finish the arc, and this is okay, but it, I just didn't feel like it was – it really warrants its own, its, its own book. Um, I, I don't think his – He's as interesting on his own as he is with other others in the mix, or maybe they're more interesting and elevate him. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I didn't enjoy this story. I felt a couple of those issues in the previous, uh, in this arc were really kind of drawn out, including this one. Um, finally getting to through, through this, that probably could have been a two issue, um, story. That's and, fair. um, it, 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 it was okay. But it's 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 it was really a good determiner for me that this is this is OK, but it's not good enough to make uh, my pull list. And it's it's not something that I need to keep reading. Um, and I'm getting some, you know, I'm getting some good Luke Cage over in Defenders and in Jessica Jones, um, where I think he comes off a lot, a lot better. And uh, just him on his own just doesn't work for me. And uh, this story just didn't work for me. I mean, I see where you're coming from, because I do think Luke Cage is a character that benefits from having another character to interact with. Whether it's, you know, uh, Iron Fist, because those two are just, you know, an odd couple in, in a very real sense. The the rich white guy and, you know, the the down on his luck at times uh, black man who's, who's just gotten the raw end of the stick at times. Um that in and of itself has a lot of, of story potential or whatnot. Uh, Jessica Jones uh, is, again, another interesting foil for Luke Cage. Likewise, almost any mix of Defenders or Avengers or whatever gives the character something to kind of bounce against and react with, whereas on his own, he's just another strong guy. He doesn't have a, a, a code name. He doesn't have a costume. There's nothing particularly flashy about him. Okay, and, and he's, he's bulletproof. Yeah. And there's something about this interpretation of him where I where I don't think he's that interesting. Um so this creator's take doesn't make him that likable and not unlikable but not doesn't make him just pop off the page and I think it's the same writer that was doing the Luke the Luke Cage and Iron Fist stuff, Power Man and Iron Fist stuff in the previous volume. I think it's the same writer. Um uh, maybe a different um Certainly artist. a different artist. Um but I think I think it's the same writer. And, but just his this this character just kind of is is going through uh, the story story beats, and um, he's he's not a, he's not really interesting to me. Well, I think part of it is they're they're leaning a little towards the characterization from uh, from the Netflix show and kind of the Bendis take on this character, and it comes down to he's a bit more pedestrian, a bit more of an average kind of a guy. Um, it's, yeah, it's, but that that character, in at least when he was on the Jessica Jones series on Netflix, which I did see, um, you know, kind of st stole the scenes he was in and was really uh, a a great character. That I don't feel that translation here. No, I, I I think he comes across a bit flatter here. But I guess for me, it's a question of where I would rank this along the spectrum of Luke Cage stuff I've I've been reading. Yeah. And I've read pretty much all the comic stuff from him, 
since the tail end of, of the original uh, Power Man and Iron Fist series. And again, I think Luke Cage with another character is superior to Luke Cage just solo. Right. Um, because of the, part of the nature of the character. There's nothing intrinsic to differentiate him from another strong guy, you know? Um, but I think this is much more to my liking than some of the Cage titles they've done. Uh, yeah, and one yeah. or two of those where it's almost so urban, it, uh, it, 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 it's incomprehensible to me almost at times. And sometimes the style they go with, like the four issue miniseries that wasn't that long ago, the style was almost so cartoony and loose and stuff. It didn't work for me. Yeah, I didn't like that one either. Whereas this is a nice clean style, but it also, I could see where somebody could describe it as perhaps a little bland. Um, I, it, I wouldn't say it's bland, but it's also not one of those that just pops off the page and is unbelievably dynamic, but it's also a character that's not that way. So I, yeah. I get entirely where you're coming from. For me, though, it's so much better than so much of what I've read of solo Luke Cage series and titles. Gotcha. And I thought this was good. It was solid. It's certainly, going back to my earlier comment, is not something where if I were to say, okay... You want to get up to speed on Luke Cage, what are the must-read things? And trying to whittle that down to the tightest list I could do, this would not make the cut. It might be under consideration, but I've got to imagine there's a lot more in the original Luke Cage, or the, the Power Man and Iron Fist series, and Heroes for Hire, and, you know, there's so many other things to pick from um, that this would easily get crowded off this list, although I think it's it's good. I liked it. It's not that one of those, it's not like the equivalent of a newspaper headline in the life of this character. This happened, while I expect Kevlar to, to be used later, I'd be disappointed if he's not. Other than that, this is the kind of story that a year from now people would have forgotten happened. That having been said, though, I did like it. I thought it was good. It was solid. I'm going to go with a, a, a B on this. Um, I do think it's something that this arc could be used uh, to get people who are Considering getting into comics uh, off the Netflix shows and stuff, something to point them towards. Uh, odds are, if I were to do that, I would do it through, like, the Marvel Digital Comics Unlimited app. You know, hey, yeah, sign up for a month, you could read all this, and oh, if you like other stuff, here's some other things, too. Yeah. Yeah, somebody who came to me watching the Netflix stuff, I would point them towards Defenders or Jessica Jones. Much stronger books so far than this. Um, I, I, I don't think this is um top-notch work from from marvel um and these creators so yeah i'm gonna i gave it to c minus um and I've, I've given it five issues and I, i'm done with this title so if it if it changes and picks up i'd love to hear it but for now uh this will be my last luke cage until the next volume or whenever legacy starts yeah i uh are they gonna renumber uh luke cage for legacy i can't, I can't remember if so, what number would they give him? Do they count Heroes for Hire? Do they not? Um, it's, it's always so hard to tell with Marvel. Actually, they are going to have one, and they are counting Heroes for Hire, Power Man, Power Man and Iron Fist, the 20-issue Cage run, the 15-issue uh, Power Man and Iron Fist series that just finished these five issues, getting them to issue 166 in fairly short order. Matter of fact, I believe that'll be the next issue. Does, um... Does Iron Fist get to, to count those Power Man and Iron Fist issues as well? Ooh, excellent question. Um, give me a sec. And no, it does not. Hmm. Interesting. It counts the 15 issue run of Iron Fist from 1975. Everything else is either Iron Fist, Immortal Iron Fist, or whatever. Um, Interesting. But the Power Man series continued the numbering from Heroes for Hire, and then Iron Fist joined the Power Man series. Gotcha. I can I can see it. Kind of makes sense. Yeah. Uh, at least as much as any of the legacy numbering does. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. I can. That, that's that makes sense to me. Shall we move on to our other book? Yes. This is the Librarians number one from Dynamite. Um, have you watched the TV show? I did. Um, I'm not sure if I've watched all of them. Um, I think I I saw a movie with Noah Wiley, and then I watched a series. Uh, but I don't know if there was more than one season. I only watched right. one season. Uh, I'm a fan of the show. Curious. It how was it would fu it was a fun series. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious how it would adapt into comics. Uh, for anyone who is passingly familiar, not familiar, want to learn more, whatever. Uh, my sister and I have done uh, a total of four episodes on uh, this property. So there's a lot of seasons. 
Well, there was one episode we did, uh, which is the three librarian TV movies, uh, featuring Noah Wiley and, uh, Bob Newhart. Um, those three were done, and then about a decade later, uh, they turned it into the, the librarians plural TV show, which has had three seasons, and my sister and I have done an episode on each of the three seasons. It's fun. It's got a good sense of humor. A lot of the people behind this were also behind Leverage, which was another excellent show. Um, the season I saw, their library was destroyed and they had to go to the annex. That was that be the first season. So you probably yeah. haven't seen the second and third. Yeah. So, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's, it's good mix of, uh, characters and actors and, uh, uh, fun writing. It's, it takes itself seriously, but not too seriously, kind of just seriously enough, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And, um, again, I was curious how this would kind of, kind of work on paper versus, you know, live action with some, some very talented actors and, and whatnot. And I think, uh, Will Pfeiffer, the writer, really captured the voice of the characters just perfectly. It sounded like what they would say and they, they acted the way I felt they should act. The story started a little differently than I think an episode might have, but overall, this kind of read like the first part of an episode of the show, maybe like the first half or thereabouts. More than just like the opening segment of a TV show. This, this really felt like there was a lot more story in here than the average comic book has. We cover a number of different scenes. The story is set up. Things are moving. We've got a plot twist or two. It feels like we're just, it, it, frank, frankly, it feels more like older school comic book writing than modern comic writing. And it made it feel a lot more, um, satisfying, frankly, than a lot of comics do. And it, it felt like it captured the tone, the sensibility, the spirit, the style of the show very well. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I thought it was, uh, it could have been like a one episode cliffhanger that's, you know, like a two parter. Yeah. And, you fair. know, the way, it, the way it ended was really, really great, really catapulted me into the next issue. And, and I had a lot of fun with the mystery and, and all these strange characters that we were learning a little bit more about. And then, um, uh, it did kind of, some of the characters got a little bit more uh, screen time and were able to kind of flesh out what they bring to the table where others kind of didn't in this issue. And I think that that'll probably balance out over time. Um, but I really thought it was, it captured what I remembered of the show, but yet felt really fresh. It had uh, a new mystery that, um, you know, I was just really kind of on the edge of my seat trying to figure out, trying to keep up and figure out what, what happened and, and who done it. And, and, um, it was, it was cool the way it unfolded. It didn't feel like it was, um, like beneath me or anything. And it didn't feel like they were, it felt like they were playing fair as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was, it was just really unraveled nicely and, and in a nice, uh, cliffhanger that, you know, make me excited for what's next. Cause this is weird. Where are we going? And, uh, it's a world that I am familiar enough with that it felt really comfortable. And I was like, Oh, the annex and you know, the, you know, knowing who the character is that kind of is the caretaker there. And, and the, you know, obviously had an instant liking for that character and, and some of the others that I, that I enjoyed in that season. And so I, had a, I already had kind of a, I was already bought in on, on liking them, but they didn't do anything to make me not, you know, it, it really captured them enough, and it, it's not like photorealistic or anything like that. Um, so the, the the there's actual cartooning going on here, and and it just really felt good, and and felt just like another episode, and and in a good way, in a very good way, and and I thought they did a good job with this for um, what what I expected coming in, which was I had lower expectations. I was wondering how it would translate and I wasn't expecting it to be as good as it was. Um, I think Rodney Buscemi, the artist, did a really good job of having the characters look like the characters from the TV show without being clearly photo referenced drawings of the actors or something. Yeah. And we've seen a couple, I forget if it was like a Doctor Who one or whatever, where the characters from the show looked like the characters from the show, but the art style for them felt a little different than the other characters that were yeah. just comic book characters. Yeah, this is not a photo reference John Larroquette, but you know who they're who who he is. 
Well, you know, if you go to uh, the page where they get to the annex, go to the following page, the second panel on that page, where we've got him kind of at a, a three quarters view or whatever of his face. Yeah. Yeah. That one seems to kind of capture a bit more of the John Larroquetteness of the Jenkins character than some of the other images, even on that same page. But it's not a dead-on likeness of him. It's just, oh, I know what character that is. Yeah, I think it, when on the following page, when she has the the goggles on and he's peering over her shoulder, that's, that's the one the, I'm talking about. Yeah, that's, is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. that's the one I think is the most uh, spot on. But but I think that you know it does the job without taking you out of the story because you're like oh boy they just traced a, a a freeze frame or something of the dvd it's something where i think the artist is a very competent and capable comic book artist yeah and was able to capture the sensibility in the look of the characters without it feeling like a caricature or to your point like just a, a trace over a, a, a screenshot or whatever kind of a deal you know there's times where it's like yeah i remember that scene where he was looking at that angle with that expression none of that here this is something where if this comic conceivably you could have it could have come before the show and they cast accordingly yeah. if you know what i mean and again i thought the the art was really tight there's a ton of story here i have to imagine this was a little bit of a challenging issue to draw because there are a couple of pages where there's just a ton of dialogue, a lot of kind of both exposition and discussion and stuff going on, and still having to have room to, to fit the, the characters, you know, six or something to a panel uh, in the background of all of that. And, and it, I mean, I, mean I, there, I think there's there's enough clues and, and things in here to you can get a little more out of it the more you the more you, you can kind of maybe figure it out a little easier. I mean, there's something with the aerial view of the. The cemetery and yes. the iconography that I, I didn't quite grasp what they were going for there, but there's something to that that you know maybe I missed. Uh, but but well, I, there, there's lots of fun stuff like that that's stu- th- thrown in there. You're like, ooh, that's gonna play out. That's gonna play out down the road, and and mm-hmm. and I like stuff like that. If you go to the first page of the story and we get the uh, the the petroglyphs or whatever, that one of the hooded figure or whatever. That seems oh, yeah. to there it sort is. of be what's in the cemetery. That does look like it, yeah. Yeah, that's right. This is one where if they had if they decide to take this and kind of readapt this story into the show. I want to see this episode, yeah. It'd be fun. I thought they uh-huh. really again captured the style and sensibility of it. And the accessibility of it. I like how when the characters first come on screen, we get three of them on here and oh, this is this character, this is this character, this is this. And that's even after we've got the inside front cover that has the here's the pitch of the series and the show and the the, the premise or whatever. And there was something about the oddball actor voiceover guy that had the show that was kind of reminiscent of maybe a That's Incredible or a Weird Tales or or something from my youth. Yeah. Something yeah. 70s ish that I I vaguely remember but can't quite put my finger on what they're what show they're they're mentioning or what they're what they're trying to evoke, but I do remember things like this happening and being aware of them and and being you know watching them and being wow that's really cool and and I I can't rem- you know I'm not really sure exactly the show that they're going for, but I think it might be an amalgam of a few that I saw when I was a kid. Yeah, and it was fun and that was a fun thing to experience because as you read it, you're like you recognize that and. Um, it makes it fun. Well, and I also liked how um, Flynn Carson was basically explaining this was the guy who got him interested in learning what really happened, what's going on out there, and that so much was possible. And just kind of this was the the show that opened his eyes and led him on the path of becoming the librarian. And that was fun. That was a fun for him to fanboy out like that. And it kind of and it was done in such a way that it didn't feel like exposition. And it was really, it was really a fun way to flesh out his character and kind of lay down the premise for the mystery that we're about going to go try to solve. Well, and it so fits the character from the, the movies and the show. They they understood the characters. They used them well. Yeah. There have been a lot of things that I thought were really good adaptations uh, of of TV shows and, and movies and whatnot. This is probably one of the best examples I can think. Of. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I make declarative statements like. Ah, uh, licensed property comics are really not my bag. They're really not that good. You know, by and large, I don't enjoy them. 
but but I keep getting proved proven wrong over and over again by stuff like this that I I just assume is going to be lower quality because it's just a licensed IP and they're just throwing lower rung talent at it. And, uh, but, but this was so much fun. This was so much fun. It was a really cool story that, um, begs to be read. And, um, that's, that's a, that's a good, that's a good start to a series. Well, and expects to be read by people who aren't familiar with the movies and TV shows. They, again, introduce the characters, they give the premise, they explain stuff. Yeah. They're not going on the assumption that this is only for the already existing audience. Now, I have some familiarity with the IP. You have complete familiarity with it. Not complete, because I haven't read the novels. Well, okay. Um, But more than me. Let's say 80%. Complete with the core canon. Yeah. And so I wonder if there's someone who comes in cold what their experience would be with this. I think they could enjoy it on a kind of a Scooby-Doo in the gang level almost of mystery solving, but a little higher brow than that. But uh, I think, I think you can come in and and get this pretty quickly and enjoy it for what it is, which is a, a, a really quirky, fun mystery in an interesting world where there are some rules that you have to figure out. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the thing, the information is there for you. I'd love it if somebody were to either read this issue or when it gets collected to trade or whatever, when the story is done, read this for somebody who's unfamiliar with the movies and, and the TV series. Start with this, if you like it, then go to the movies and the TV series and see if the show is what you expect based on this or not. In other words, is this a viable on-ramp into the, the, the property? I'd like to think it is, but to your point, yeah, I already know who the characters are. Um, it's just they've done stuff here that I don't typically see when I read a Star Trek novel or comic or other thing that's adapted from a show that, well, everybody knows who Doc Brown and, and Marty McFly are or what have you. Right. You know, they're not making those assumptions here, and it's, well, they've got some exposition because of that. It's not getting in the way of the story, and it's certainly not diminishing the amount of story. Again, I would put this on par with at least three, maybe four issues of many other comic books uh, in terms of the amount of story material. Yeah, like, like I said, I, I, it felt like a full episode, maybe the two-parter, like the first half of a two-parter. I mean, it didn't feel like just, you know, set up. It yeah. really felt like there's plenty here. There was there was plenty in the mystery uh, that was uncovered, plenty of plot twists. They were able to, you know, visit a grave and and revisit that grave after visiting the guy in the prison and witness a murder and and you know do a have a break in and discover uh something going on that was out of that felt out of time um and there, there yeah there's a lot here and and i enjoyed it and it was you know could, slightly far-fetched but if you if you're familiar with the property you know you know that it's going to be a little bit wacky but yeah. not too much i didn't feel and um and I, I feel like if I, I, I really think this is uh, this was a fun series and something that uh, I would recommend to others, even if they haven't checked out librarians. I think it's a strong enough read that uh, definitely could be something that I would recommend. Um, I, I didn't quite give it the A minus. This is at a B plus for me. Um, I think the art's not quite there. Uh, it's passable. Um, it t- helps tell the story, but it's not quite as strong as some of the stuff you might be used to. Um, but but still a really strong book and uh, something that I enjoyed reading. I- I'm going with the A plus here. I thought the art was, oh, wow. was okay. strong. I think this is not only an incredibly good adaptation of uh, a movie uh, TV property, but one that is solid enough that it could create fans of that property solely through what it's doing in this issue. And I think that's a pretty high bar and one that uh, most adaptations uh, we've read have have not even come close to measuring up to. Yeah. But between the amount of story, the quality of that story, the uh, appropriate use in, in uh, um, capturing of the tone, style, sensibility, likenesses, mannerisms, voice, uh, in, you know, uh, uh, speech patterns and so forth, um, they did just a terrific job. This is something that uh, certainly if, if any of the, the people connected to the TV show haven't checked this out, I think they'd be very proud of it. And again, this is the sort of thing that I think could act as an on-ramp for people into the show. Uh, again, I was I was 
amazed how good this was. I went in there thinking, ah, oh, well, they'll do okay. Mm-hmm. You know, it'll be a, a short little story, the equivalent yeah. maybe of an, a, a full episode through yeah. the totality of, of, of the run. But they, uh, they knocked it out of the park. I thought they did a sensational job. Is this something that you think Kay might check out because of her fondness for the property? Possibly. I'm certainly going to suggest it to her. Um, she does not read many comics. Um, this is one of the ones that I do think she would enjoy. Um, but now, whether now she should, reads it or not, don't know. Um, the uh, season two and season three, uh, how do they stack up compared to season one? Because I haven't seen either one of those. Season one, I thought, had the best arc throughout the whole season. The other ones, I thought, were were fun and good. And we saw some definite character progressions and a couple of changes and stuff. The effects get uh, ramped up in the other seasons. Uh, if you like the first, you'll like the other two. And then um, compare that to the uh, movies. The movies, which kicked all of this off, um, I really like the first one the best. The other two were good, but you've got just Derivative. Flynn Carson and you don't have as many foils to bounce off of. Ah. So you don't have quite the group chemistry that you've got with the librarians, plural. Um, Stanya Kaddick from Castle was in one of them, uh, one of the movies. She did a great job, but it was a little bit, it was just different points in, in Flynn's life. Um, and uh, really the first one is, is hard to measure up to. The others were good, but um, the first one, which I forget the name of off the top of my head again, you can check the, uh, the TV Spotlight episodes uh, we've done. Um, some of the earlier ones might still be under the round table section, but anyways, um, it's, it's a fun property and well worth checking out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, really, uh, really pleasant surprise. And, uh, I always like those. Yeah. It, it hurts, it hurts my pull list cause there's another one, but I just, I got rid of Luke, Luke Cage. So I've got room for it. Well, speaking of, of pull lists and stuff, um, <laughs> and reading lists and reading lists, um, you know, for me, the problem isn't that I'm getting too much. It's that I'm not spending enough time reading. That's exactly what the problem is. Uh, it's 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 all a matter of perspective. Um, I've only read maybe a dozen or so comics since the last time we recorded. I had hoped to get more done over the weekend, but I had some other stuff that just took up way more time than I thought it would. Um, so I, I didn't have the time. Uh, I've had a couple of fairly large shipments uh, of comics uh, come in over the last... Uh, few weeks so i'm now back up closing in on i think 280 ish comics um so i just like i said i need to just put some other things in you know on the back burner or whatever and just spend some time doing some reading because i haven't done that uh, for the last couple of weeks you know, i've you, had a few you, periods where i plowed through a lot i just need a few more of those periods than like the last week or two where i just i've read probably two dozen comics in the last two weeks and that's it you know you waste eight hours a day sleeping and I think perhaps you could skip the sleeping and you could just read constantly. There might be some side effects down the road where that doesn't balance out, but I think the short-term benefits would would be really worth it. You think I get eight hours of sleep? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, it's, six? It's just a matter of balancing stuff out. Um, I had one or two uh, side projects I've been playing around with and some stuff like that. It's all good. It's all fun. It's oh, yeah. just... When I get like 60 comics uh, in a given week yeah. or something, um, I think the last, uh, well, the, the the stuff I just got this week was 50 comics. Prior to that, it was 62. Prior to that, it was uh, uh, 47. Yeah. That right there is, um, what, a hundred and almost 160 comics, which I was... is about where I was at in terms of what I had left to read uh, prior to that. I was really doing a good job of kind of whittling my list down to the best and brightest. And I was down around 20 a week and I've ballooned back up uh, to over 30 again. And it's because metal has pulled me in a lot more than I thought Mm. it would. It's because um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of buying into the marketing for legacy and I'm excited about a lot of these. And so I'm reading a lot of these titles leading up to legacy so that I'm ready uh-huh. To to tr- to sample those and give them a good uh, uh, like a rebirth try, like I did with with that launch. And so, Marvel and DC are getting a lot more love from me and and making it on the pit, on the the pull list now. And you know, there's and then of course every other publisher continues to pump out stuff that catches my eye. And 
yeah, it's it, it's a lot of fun, but it's kind of drowning out every other hobby or thing that I have outside of uh, a few, you know, requirements of work and family that, that it's 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 kind of drowning out everything else because there's so much good stuff. And um, I want to read it all. I want to read more, actually. But, I, you know, it's only so much so much time in a week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the other problem I'm going to have is the new TV season starts up soon. Oh yeah, but, yeah. We um we've been gearing up for that too, and trying to clear out the DVR because they were going to need more room as the season unfolds. Yeah. Well, and part of what I've been doing of late is uh, some of that too. I've got a number of TV episodes coming up that took a little bit of of well, not a little bit, a lot of watching time just to to view the source material before my sister and I talked about it. Now I got to find the time to edit those and get those up. Um. It's all good. It's just uh, there's so much in terms of content to consume right now. Yeah. And at some point I may decide, you know, okay, maybe I do need to cut back or something. But, you know, I it, it hasn't been that way so far. Yeah, I was telling the guys on the Slack channel last night, I would just finished uh, the Supergirl season in time for the new season to start. And I actually think that the move to CW... It's a. It was a better, stronger season than than the CBS season was. It it was it was a fantastic uh, series. I uh, really really enjoyed it. And um, um uh, there's so many good good comic shows, let alone other genres uh, out, outside of that. But there's so many good comic shows and comic related shows that uh, it's going to be a my my timer my DVR timer is going to be busy. Yeah. Well. Again, all this, the continuing shows, and like you said, the flood of new ones, um, it's, it, it's gonna be hard to keep up. I'm almost two seasons behind now on Gotham. At some point, I'll catch up. I'm, I'm at the point where if they have a TV season where there's just nothing good, I think I'll survive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I still have backlogs of stuff, and I'm on the fence about Inhumans. I, I'm not sure. I haven't heard any really strong early returns on folks that have seen that in advance. Um, so uh, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of worried that it's it, maybe I maybe I might skip that one since I bailed out of uh, Agents of Shield. One of the ones uh, we caught up on was fourth season of Agents of Shield, and uh, I don't know when I'll get that episode edited and up, but um, good season. It was, huh? Okay. Yeah. I will I will leave it at that and go on at length during that episode. Um, Fantastic. I'm at the point where I'm kind of almost doing the wait for trade at, uh, attitude on the TV shows. Uh, we'll kind of binge watch some stuff, um, you know, and, and catch up that way. Other shows we try to stay current on, but there's so many. If we try to stay current, we just wouldn't have time for anything else. So during the, the, the hiatuses of during the season, maybe when we get to some of the movies or some catch up on some other stuff or whatever, I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, uh, the Netflix and Amazon shows and Hulu's and and all of those kind of get sh- pushed to the back burner I, be, because I feel like I've got to kind of keep up with this other stuff that's on networks because those will always be there and I've missed some seasons of things that uh, were really well regarded uh, on the streaming services so I really need to get back and spend some time over there and I don't know when that's going to be. I think it really puts a premium on each person figuring out what type of story they like, why they like it, and figuring that out for themselves. Because what I like, you may not, and vice versa. For every person, that answer is different. But if you know for you what that answer is and can measure a property against that, do so. Because there's properties that, for whatever your criteria is, there's going to be stuff out there you love. And if you're just watching stuff, then it's all right. You know, again, there's there's so many stories waiting to be consumed um, and pick and choose. And that's part of why I'm okay having, you know, two short boxes sitting here that are are full of unread comics because I'm prioritizing this, the stuff I'm enjoying more. This is the stuff I can put off until later. I'm still going to enjoy it when I get to it, but it's not one that's got an urgency to it. Unless you think you don't like licensed properties like me, and then you get, you know, kind of hit upside the head with great stuff. That's like, oh, well, maybe maybe I do like some. Maybe I can't really be definitive about stuff like that. Well, but the criteria should be what kind of story do you like in terms of characterization, plot points, or narrative techniques, or whatever, versus what is the origin or genesis of the property. 
You know, it's it's easy to say, well, I don't think licensed properties tend to be done well in comics or, or make the transition from one medium to another well, but that that's that's uh, ruling with a fairly broad uh, uh, yeah. generalization. Now, I think if you if I if I took all my scores over time of licensed property books, uh, they would be significantly lower. But I am pleasantly surprised from time to time. Well, no, no, and I'm not saying that your conclusion and generalization is is wrong or not based on ample evidence. But, uh, you know, again, there's being open to new stuff, which is one of the things I really appreciate about you is, is you're willing to try a lot of stuff. Um, that's that's how you find those hidden gems. Sure do. My goodness. We've had, we've had some great ones come out of nowhere. Yeah, definitely. Let's see. The preview spotlight deadline is going to be uh, Saturday, October 7th. That's bright and early that morning, or at least as bright and early as I can get out of bed and start working on it. Uh, plenty of interesting things coming out in the, the new previews, so hopefully people will find a lot of stuff. Officially this- comes out tomorrow as we're recording, but it's already up on the forum, uh, the online link, so you can um, pick and choose at your will. This will be uh, episode 120 of the preview spotlight, so this will conclude 10 years of, of preview spotlights. Oh, wow, great. I'd like to think that we've uh, helped fun- some people find some cool stuff that they've enjoyed and added to their pull list for the long term. And uh, again, these episodes only work because you guys send in clips, and that's, that's one of the things I love uh, about doing all this stuff. Then we're going to have the comic book page teleconference the following Saturday, October 14th. That's at 7 p.m. Central Time. And that's a, you know, hop on Skype. Let me know you're in. I'll connect you to the call and we'll talk about whatever we talk about. Uh, the, the group of people tends to vary from month to month based on who's got what going on in their life and who has the time. And we talk about, again, whatever comes up. So the topics can vary quite a bit from, uh, from month to month. It's a lot of fun. John is the, John is the constant. I try to be. Yeah. At least try to be the coordinator. Uh, but we've had a uh, lot of lot of fun discussions. Uh, really good stuff. So anything else? Or does that pretty much do it? Hey, that does it. 